Next Generation Officer at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to our Young Professionals Program discussing transformative science and technology. Uh, we're in for a very lively discussion this evening, and as you can see, some extra effects, um, and very happy to have you all join us um, in the Council. Most of you know the House rules, but for some of our guests and newcomers, tonight's program is on the record and being live streamed, so we ask that you please silence your phones, but keep them out as we'll be taking questions through our online survey technology. You can find the link to submit questions on the screens on either side of me. Simply type chi.cnf.io into your device browser, select tonight's program, and submit your question for consideration. We very much welcome your engagement on social media. This is a tech program after all. Um, please feel free to post pictures um, or tweets or Instagram posts and use the hashtag, hashtag CouncilYP in your posts. As you're posting, though, please know that views expressed by individuals we host are their own and do not represent institutional views or positions of the Council. The Council engages Chicago's next generation of leaders with programming to increase your global fluency and cultural competence. I encourage you, if you're not yet a member with us, to consider joining. Um, if you have any questions about membership or getting involved with the Council and YP Network, you can visit Anna, our young professional ambassador. She'll be at the table in the back of the room. Lastly, we are truly grateful to partner with the Museum of Science and Industry um, this evening. Thank you to MSI for your support and partnership and assistance in this program. We're pleased to be giving everyone tickets um, to attend the exhibit Where to Wired or Wired to Wear at MSI running through 2020. And I believe that you received a special code that you can use um, for um, admission to the exhibit in your confirmation note. Now it is my pleasure to welcome Anthony Vitiliano. He's the Vice President of Exhibitions and Engagement at the Museum of Science and Industry, um, and he will introduce our panel. Anthony oversees the Exhibitions and Collections Division that harbors the museum's more than 35,000 artifacts. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Anthony. Hello, everybody. How are you? Um, we're thrilled to be here. The Museum of Science and Industry is, is, is thrilled to partner with the Chicago Council on Global Affairs uh, for this evening panel. We have some amazing people here. Um, and when I think about you know, what it means to have an idea that can change the world, which all of these people that are right in here are going to talk about how they're changing the world, uh, I think it's important to remember two key pieces of information. And the first, and we, we tr preach this at the museum a lot, is that idea that failure is part of the process. Um, it, it, it's this element that we want to challenge everyone to come over the, trial, uh, the trials and errors that kind of are a part of the creative process that yields a better and stronger outcome. And it's important to think about how, how people that throughout the museum, when they come there, they, they, they understand that failure is OK, and they want to create that space for them. And, we have some of these products in the back here for our Wired to Wear exhibit that represent a bit of a failure that's happening right now. We have a dress that's not working, but you can come see it at the exhibit. So that's an example of failure in real life being there. Um, and it, it's a big part of what we uh, try and preach at the museum. The second is that there's no right way to be an innovator. In Wired to Wear, which is our, our newest exhibition, um, there are amazing ideas, and the determination to bring them to life is true in every one of those pieces. We set out to really celebrate designers and makers, uh, engineers, artists, uh, crazy people, uh, <laughs> really kind of come together through that spirit of creativity and invention. Um, so everyone can see the active role that you can play in changing the world, uh, and, and that's apparent in everything that we show within that exhibition. And so with that, it's really my pleasure to introduce uh, tonight's amazing speakers. Uh, each speaker will deliver a short presentation, about f 10 minutes or so, uh, followed by a panel that will um, open up the discussion, and then they'll take some of your questions. So our first uh, presenter is Benaz Farai. Uh, she is a designer, creative technologist, um, working at the intersection of fashion, architecture, and interaction design. 
Her work has been exhibited internationally at Ars Electronica Linz, uh, the Context Art Meet in Miami, and has been featured in Wired, BBC, CNN, The Guardian, Frame Magazine, and many other places. She's amazing, um, and I think you're really going to enjoy her work. Second up is Dr. Emily Landon. Uh, she's an infectious disease specialist at the University of Chicago. Um, she's an epidemiologist and a medical ethicist. And she has been practicing medicine for nearly two decades and was at the forefront in addressing the recent measles outbreak, uh, which is hitting somewhat close to home. I'm going on a trip to Disney World with my son, and we're a little freaked out about that, but she just told me it's all good, so we're OK. Um, and our third uh, speaker is Haotian Wang, and he is a, an applied physicist and scientist and currently a professor in the Department of Chemical and Biomecular Engineering at Rice University. Uh, he was named as 2019 Forbes 30 Under 30 in science for his efforts to help solve climate change. So we have someone who's trying to solve climate change, we have someone battling measles, and then we have uh, an amazing uh, artist creating uh, the intersection of technology and creativity coming together. So I tried to get my inbox to zero today, but those people are doing amazing things. Um, and then finally, our moderator is Seth Kravitz. Uh, he's the CEO at uh, Flurn and co-founder of Technori. Seth has spent over a decade founding and selling um, technology companies and is a former Cranes 40 on 40 and Cranes Tech 50 recipient. Uh, so now, uh, let me please join and everybody uh, welcoming our first speaker and presenter, Benaz Farai. Thank you. Hi, everyone. As someone who has been fascinated by movement, texture, and tactility of the matter, I've been exploring how artificial intelligence can be embedded into substrate of the matter, as though machines become materials and materials become machine. I'm interested to see how uh, we can explore a new relationship between human body and environments, ranging from the scale of human body and the world of variable and fashion, all the way to architecture space and the world of uh, interactive architectures. I'm particularly interested to see uh, how these technologies and how emotive matter can change the perception of the human body, the way that we communicate with one another, and also the way that we socially interact with one another. And I have been doing this type of work through series of exploration and art installation and fashion pieces inspired by nature, not only in terms of form and morphology, but I'm interested to see how we can learn from intelligence and material intelligence that you see in nature and apply that principles in the world of fashion. So I've been really fortunate to work on a new project for the Museum of Science and Industry uh, here in Chicago, Iridescence. Iridescence is an interactive uh, 3D printed piece equipped with the facial tracking camera that is responding to the facial expressions of the people. Inspired by hummingbird, um, hummingbird is an amazing creature. It can change its color from dark green to iridescence pink with a twist of its head for social uh, uh, mating ritual. So I've been wondering how we can develop new materials that it can imitate the same type of behavior. It can change color and it can change shape and respond to the information from the people. So I'm going to take you through a very short video for production of this piece, which is right now in the display in the uh, Museum of Science and Industry. This was a very technical challenge that how we can design not only color change, but also shape changing behavior inspired by Hummingbird. For doing so, I went through many iterations with my team through production of electromagnetic actuators that uh, was made in house from uh, many iteration from hinge design to understanding the science behind electromagnetic uh, mechanisms. Um, so it was a very interesting journey to go through this, this project, but also in terms of its form was inspired by 17th century big color that you can see in Victorian style of fashion. So it was, the idea was how can we create something that um, it's like a big display around the head of the wearer and it can act as a dynamic display. It can change how we interact with one another. 
It also um, holds 200 elements that they can each individually move and change color from uh, dark blue to almost magenta and gold. Each of these electromagnetic actuators consists of many components that you can see in this video. They come together, all made in-house. Um, and um, the idea was to how we can make a sort of very simple production that a technician from the museum can take it in and out, each individually controlled uh, easily. To just give you an overview, this piece um, it has 200 moving parts, which works as a muscle, 40 uh, driver boards that work as a nervous system, and four uh, microcontrollers that they work as a brain, equipped with one camera that acts as an eye. So in every moment, an eye gather information from the people's location as well as their facial expressions, capture those information, send it to the brain. The brain sends a signal to the nervous system, which are the driver boards, and the driver boards control the behavior of these uh, moving actuators. Also, it was about how we can um, uh, capture not only one face or two face, but we can capture up to 35 face. And based on their different emotion, we can trigger different type of animations. So what is the equivalent of happy movement? Um, or what is uh, if the dress can capture anger or aggression? And what is the, the, the garment movement is going to be? Uh, so in these videos, you can see that, for instance, if the happy face is detected, it can generate a, a ripple um, or rippling movement from inside toward out. Or when it's angry, it moves really fast as it almost repel you. Uh, conceptually, this project really also think about the ways that we interact with one, other, one another, but also understanding the, the sensory input from our environment. So if we can sense our environment through our garment, um, uh, and not only if you have your eyes closed, you can sense where people are standing in front of you, but you can also understand what kind of emotions they have. At the end, I would like to say that um, these uh, computational systems and artificial intelligence, when they're embedded into the substrate of the matter, they can, despite our anxiety about the smart technologies and AI, I think there is a potential for empathy. They can potentially become an extension of one's being, and they can help us uh, and coexist with us. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Emily Landon. Hey. How cool is that? OK, this is way less cool. I have to start right there. I'm here to talk to you about the newest innovations in healthcare and how we prevent the transmission of disease. And best place to start, measles. How do we prevent measles? There is an amazing innovation that prevents measles transmission 99% of the time. It is, was developed in 1960, and it's called the measles vaccine. Um, works really, really well, and if you haven't had it, I strongly recommend it. But there's something that we have to do for people that can't get the vaccine, and people who get sick anyway because they're immunocompromised or have other problems. You all know about Ebola. You've also heard about this Candida auris, terrible, deadly fungus from the front page of the New York Times. Um, and there are a lot of things that we can do to help control these spread in hospital. But the hospitals are the place where people live the closest together. But the innovations that we have in order to prevent these things go back even further than 1960 to 1860, when Semmelweis discovered that obstetricians were far less likely to have their patients die of perperial sepsis if they dipped their hands in chlorinated lime solution after taking care of autopsies downstairs. Yeah, blows the mind, right? <laughs> It seems like it would be obvious to us, but they didn't even know about the germ theory then. Since then, we have tons of evidence that hand hygiene and other things like that, like barrier precautions, prevent transmission of infections in hospitals, but that doesn't mean that we do it. And we send around people to do these observations, these secret shoppers that do observations of all of our healthcare providers to see if they're cleaning their hands. And we get some evidence, but when we send around even more really secret shoppers, we get even poorer hand hygiene compliance. 
Yet these are things that are supposed to happen 100,000 times a day in my hospital alone at the University of Chicago. We can't possibly have one observer that collect all of that data. The thousand observations that we were collecting every year when we were using observers is kind of like having a scientist look at the tail of an elephant and say it's a snake. You just don't know what you have. And so there must be a better way to monitor this really simple behavioral practice. I mean, we're able to monitor all these other things electronically. I mean, we can have clothes that help display our emotions. And yet we have a hard time doing that. Well, a lot of people are worried about the idea of having people watch their behavior every single step of everything that they do in a hospital. But I felt like this was really important. So I actually started working with Motorola and Illinois Institute of Technology about 10 years ago, maybe longer now, to develop a system that would monitor when people use the hand gel dispensers and when they went in and out of patient rooms. We made something that worked, but it had antennas the size of iPads attached to every one of the hand gel dispensers. The good news is other third-party vendors came along and started to create newer products. And now we have one at the University of Chicago that is pretty amazing. We are one of the only hospitals in the country to do 24-7 automated monitoring of hand hygiene in every single one of our inpatient rooms. We have counters in every hand gel and every soap dispenser that say how often these things are dispensed. And we have activity counters at every doorway that help determine when people go into rooms and come out of rooms. Rooms. These mix together in the cloud and come back to the front line in the nurse's station of every single unit with a real-time hand hygiene compliance score. And we can see exactly how we're doing every minute of every day and hopefully use that data to help us get better. So now that we can measure all this hand hygiene, how do we change it? I mean, it's pretty much the same as trying to quit smoking, stop biting your nails, stop looking at your phone, lose weight. It's these real honest to goodness behavioral changes that are really hard to do in the rest of your life are also hard to do in the hospital. We want our healthcare providers to think about the complex things they need to take care of with the patient, not whether or not they use hand gel on the way in the door, but they're gonna need to think about it for at least long enough to get better at it. And so we developed a number of systems to basically do trial and error, to try and figure out how to change behavior in healthcare providers. We have these leadership virtual huddles where all of the nurse leaders from every unit get together every week and talk about the hand hygiene compliance. And they try all sorts of different things. And over time, we can see which things make hand hygiene better and which things don't. We know, for example, that having nurses who are assigned to remind all of the other people that come onto the unit about their hand hygiene compliance and then rewarding them for the entire unit's performance is probably the best way to improve hand hygiene. The other thing we know is that when secretaries tweet out or send out a page about what the hand hygiene compliance is when it falls below a certain level, it's one of the best ways to get everybody back on board. But even more interesting is that it's not important to wash your hands more frequently. It's actually important to reduce the number of times you have to go into and out of each room by batching your tasks, something that seemingly has nothing to do with hand hygiene. So this kind of technology can really change the way we do things in hospitals, and that's what I'm trying to do. We do know from the study that we did, in 18 months, every 1% improvement in hand hygiene compliance resulted in a 4% decrease in MRSA infections. We saved $2 million in MRSA costs alone in the 18 months that we were looking at this particular data. Hand hygiene is just one piece of things that we can learn with better automation, more innovation in hospitals. And we see that same slow and steady rise that you wanna see the opposite direction when you're looking at the scale because it means you'll keep it off. Same thing with us. Over five years, we've shown almost awesome hand hygiene rates. It's not good enough for me yet, it's not good enough for you, but we're definitely going in the direction we want to so that you know that you're gonna be safe and you won't catch anything like measles when you come to my hospital. <laughs> so thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Hao Tian Wang. Thank you. So imagine that in the future, all the carbon dioxide we generated 
you know, from burning fuels, driving our cars, or lighting our rooms, can be collected and then converted back to useful chemicals for reuse. Then we can probably close the anthropogenic carbon loop with no more CO2 emission. This is actually the dream our research group at Rice University is currently chasing. So let me first show you a chart that shows the uh, long-term atmospheric CO2 con concentration. So it actually, over the past 2,000 years in our human history, it actually remains quite stable until a very rapid increase right after the Industrial Revolution, about 200 years ago. If we zoom into that, we can see the concentration continues to increase with even more and more steeper slope and no signs of slowing down. And this increase in the concentration is obvious to have a direct impact on the global average of the uh, temperature. Over the past one or 200 years, it has been increased uh, to about one to two degrees Celsius in average. If the global warming effect is a slow process and it's like not easy for us to feel directly, the, uh, you know, the environmental pollution associated with you know, a lot of the uh, fossil fuel consumptions might, be more, ha might have more direct impact on our everyday life. So we need to take actions right away. And so our group trying to learn a lot of things from our nature mother who actually has been de dealing with CO2 for you know, billions of years. That is the, uh, you know, the green plant for natural photosynthesis. So you know, in green leaves, they can take you know, CO2, water, into the green leaves. With the energy input from the solar, they can catalyze the carbon dioxide into glucose as the fuels for their growth. And uh, if we can calculate the energy efficiency, they can convert the solar energy into the chemical fuels that they generated, it's actually less than 1%, which means that every 100 unit of the energy, the solar energy shine on the green leaf, can result in less than one unit of the chemical energy. This is very, you know, a low energy efficiencies, right? But it's, it's rather effective. It keeps the, the CO2 level very, very stable over the past thousands of years. Our idea is to mimic this process as we call it artificial photosynthesis. Imagine that we have the solar. If we can first convert the solar energy using solar panels into electricity, that usually comes with a very high energy efficiency around 20% from solar energy to electricity. Using that renewable electricity into our electrochemical cells, we can drive an electrochemical reaction where in the, in, the, in the cell on the right hand side, water can get oxidized into oxygen and carbon dioxide can get reduced to whatever we want by designing different catalysts you know, CO, methane, ethanol, a lot of things that we use every day. And if we look at this reaction in an overall point of view, we actually take into CO2 and water with the input of solar energy and the help of catalyst, we can get the carbon fuels or chemicals for our everyday use and also emits the oxygen. That is exactly the same process with the natural photosynthesis. And in one of our recent pro, uh, you know, research works, we successfully discovered a very unique and new catalyst. We call it single atom catalyst that can highly selectively reduce carbon dioxide into CO. And with that technology, we successfully skilled up the material synthesis as well as the electrochemical reaction cell into a skilled up demo cell like this. And with that, we can very efficiently reduce our carbon dioxide into carbon monoxide valuable products at a rate about three to four liters per hour. 
Imagine if in the future for practical applications, if we can combine hundreds of these unit cells together, we can easily reduce tons of CO2 into valuable products every day. Um, and if you calculate everything, the energy conversion efficiencies, we can, in using our, photo, uh, our artificial photosynthesis system, the solar energy conversion to the chemical fuels is orders of magnitudes higher than the efficiency in the uh, natural photosynthesis. So our, in, with all the efforts coming from the whole community, we hope that in the future, our dream can come true, like we can take all the carbon dioxide we generated, convert it back to the chemical fuels we use, and then we close the anthropogenic carbon loop with no more CO2 emissions. My name is Hao Ting Wang, and we are still working on that. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our panel. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, we were already introduced, but we might as well do it again. Uh, you want to introduce yourselves? Hao Tian Wang from Rice University. Emily Landon, University of Chicago. Benaz Farahi from USC. Right, I'm kind of curious, uh, each one of you is slightly, they're at slightly different phases with your current technology. Can you kind of give me an idea of like, where in the process of bringing this to its full fruition are you currently? Um, well, for me, it's more um, sort of so far been sort of art practice, art design practice in which I was doing series of work that um, creates a body of work, which is a practice that I'm uh, interested to pursue further. So I would say um, more of similar type of work in either art, art installation, fashion items, and really to, to create conversation around technology, art, and um, I would say the social and psychological aspects of art. That is something that I would be interested to pursue in the next few years uh, more in detail, too. Well, I, use, I started new technology and then abandoned it to try and use other people's better technology. They don't really, that's, that's not really my focus. But I, I would say that what we have right now is good and it, it works really well, but we're definitely looking for upgrades all the time, always looking for new ways to be more individualized in the way that we monitor, monitor to monitor more things, to give people more feedback, to help people do a better job at the jobs they care about. So for my part, um, the challenge we are facing is definitely the uh, fossil fuel consumption is too much of the CO2 emission as well as the pollutions. So we are trying to design a new technology that we can more efficiently use our energy without pollutions, without CO2 emissions. That um, takes a long time for the whole global society to be changed from a fossil fuel based society to a mixed based and in the end potentially can become a very, very renewable, 100% uh, renewable based society. Right, I think uh, a lot of people when they see a technology, they're like, oh, you know, it seems obvious, like, oh, it should have existed, that couldn't have taken very long to think up, whatever. We have these broad assumptions when we walk into a store and you just see something for sale that there wasn't a tremendous amount of trial and error going into it. So I'm kind of curious about what was, what was the process like as far as the big challenges you faced and like moments maybe you wanted to give up but you didn't and you know, what's a little bit of the story behind the process? I mean, uh, I think my story perhaps um, 
it was like uh, so far always the struggle of um, an idea that started and then iterations and experimentation. So for me personally, it was always not exactly uh, knowing what is the answer or where it's heading, but really believing in the process in itself. Uh, so I'm interested to see how we can sort of have less of a top-down approach to design uh, and art in general, and more really have hands-on experience and experimentation. I, I do believe that innovation happens through this sort of uh, experimentation and experimental approach. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm a big believer in that. And um, I think, although sometimes it can be frustrating uh, to go back and forth from the idea to, to failures to the next iterations, but I think in, there is a pleasure in doing that. And some of the ideas can actually emerge out of that process. Yeah, we had, um, we started with something I told you that had like, like antennas as big as iPads. And then we switched to another, we tried another system that failed to be able to detect what it was supposed to be able to detect in real life settings. Because what you can do in a lab when you're sort of trying to create technology that works in like a lab setting is not the same as using it in real everyday people in behavior. And measuring real human being behavior is really different from measuring the way you think real human behavior is. Bless you, that's my child sneezing a million times. Maybe I should have given him more Zyrtec, huh? Um, so uh, I think it's, I think that we do so much extra testing on this stuff when we put in this kind of technology beyond what the manufacturers recommend to make sure that we are validating that it works exactly the way we think it's going to work in, um, in a real life setting. And I think that's, a, so we're probably further along in that aspect of things than, than some of these other technologies. But it is, it is really, it's a lot of um, rewiring, reconfiguring, redoing it, moving the sensors, changing everything around, and a lot more of that. Than, um, than I would have ever imagined it would be. So I think the, um, for the development of clean technology, um, there might be some challenges if you know, only you receive momentum from the government incentives, because that's a global issue. And it, it sometimes, at the beginning, it doesn't make money uh, out of the society, right? So the technology may be even more expensive than current technology. But why we should develop that? So I think the major, um, so at that time, we were thinking like, um, you know, if you continue to receive the momentum from the government, if you cannot become independent uh, receiving the momentum from the market itself, the development might not be sustainable. And that, uh, at the beginning, is the, the huge challenge. But along the way, actually, we do a lot of innovations, and we develop a, a lot of uh, sideway technologies that can actually find other applications. So that's the, a lot of essentials of fundamental research, that you are aiming at one direction, but during that effort, you have a lot of you know, discoveries, you have a lot of impact, and you can kind of begin to gain a lot of momentum for, from the whole society, not only in the government. Uh, you begin to make profits of a product, and that still can strongly drive the, the, the process of clean technology development. So for, for each one of you, you've, your products are in developments are kind of in the wild, and some of them maybe not so, some of them are just a little earlier, but I'm kind of curious, what's the, what is the early feedback from the community? What do they think? What are they telling you? I'm assuming as soon as you, usually when you bring out a great idea to someone and you're working on it, they just start throwing a thousand more ideas at you that you do with it. So I'm just kind of curious, what's been the reaction? And you know, are, are people excited? Or, you know? I mean, in my work, just because it's more in the art and design, it's different. It's I make series of projects rather than one big project. Um, and that creates conversation, creates excitement, uh, which is quite interesting to observe. I often sometimes even get emails from people like uh, saying that, oh, where, where can we buy this product? And I'm like, this is not a product. <laughs> so I'm not making a product for, for, for uh, mass production as such. But I'm interested in that conversation. But that excitement in public around the fact that they're excited to know if they can buy a garment that it can track 
human expressions or human gaze uh, to respond differently, that already tells so much. Um, and I think there is enough interest in the public around these topics. It would define what is the future of wearables, what is the future of our clothing. clothing. Well, I think um, when you have a new technology that's expected to try and change people or change the way people do things, there is sort of this, um, a lot of people who describe change literature suggest that the Kubler-Ross stages of grief also apply to change. And this, this is what I say to people a lot. Um, they say, number one, that they are um, angry at me for monitoring them. And then they tell me, but I don't need to wash my hands because I just washed them for the other room. That's called bargaining, by the way. Then, <laughs> then, um, then they get uh, super depressed and, um, and are not happy because they feel like they're never going to be able to change. And then eventually, they come to some form of acceptance. And so there, there's a lot that goes into this. And so I get really mixed reactions. People are often really happy at first first and then they get really frustrated and they get angry and they get sad. And you have to be able to sort of weather those storms and be like a bobbing on the top of the water and say, yeah, I get that you don't like this aspect of it. Let's see how it goes. Because you can't, you can't just say, to everything that everybody says, well, I don't like that it does this, and so I want to get rid of it now. You know, or I don't want it to do this, and I want it to be different. Let's see how it works in your life. Let's give it a minute. Kind of like when you get a new phone, and you're like, or, or they like do an update on your phone, and you're like, oh, the font is different. Ugh. You know, it, it looks different. Um, but then you kind of like, it, it becomes part of your life, and then you're really living with it, and then you can really know. And the feedback I get is, I want it to be more individualized. It would be helpful if it was more individualized, and that's what we're pursuing. Um, you know, uh, during our innovation process, uh, there are definitely a lot of feedbacks, uh, not only from our you know, colleagues, our peers, but also from you know, the society. Why you want to convert CO2? Why uh, you are focused on these type of uh, reactions? Because clean technology is definitely a very wide field. Solar panels, you know, um, you know, water pumps, a lot of things. But why am I trying to focus on that? And uh, even if with some negative feedbacks or at the beginning, is because uh, as a very beginning research group, we can only focus on one very sharp topic. And at the beginning, you don't even need to know what the uh, re what these focus can go how long in the future. Just do that. That's my uh, message to my students. You just do that. And along that process, at the, as what I just uh, said, along that process, you can uh, come up with a lot of interesting p problems and topics. And because we call it research, it's because if you can you know, know the results in advance, that's not research. The research is you want to go there, and along the process, you go other ways, and it becomes very successful. So that's the reason why we say uh, a lot of feedback from the uh, colleagues is very helpful, that, but you don't necessarily to listen to all of them. You just follow your heart to do whatever you want. Just love to add some something more with just uh, the most previous comments, it's exactly, sometimes it's more like cultivating a certain um, sort of image even in public. So it's not necessarily just coming with a product that actually changes it, but I mean, one of the good example, I think, in wire to wear and, and I think my excitement uh, personally as participants of that in a way is the fact that how people, um, also a lot of young generation and kids would go to this exhibition, it's more about uh, stretching their imagination that what is possible. So a lot of time what we do, um, no matter if it actually make its way to become a mass product, um, a mass produced product, or not, I think its role also can be to really stretch what is the future of this type of innovation. So creating that type of a space or platform to share, to stretch ima imagination, I think it's really important. Well, that kind of brings me to the next question of the, the social implications of what you're building, like what happens to a society that does adopt what we're talking about. So society where we are cap capturing tons of carbon, and we're using it for basically 
it is replacing a lot of fossil fuels and a lot of things. That's a major change. The idea of hospital-borne infections, which are a much larger problem than I ever knew about, uh, becoming a thing of the past, the ability to have materials and products and surfaces and things you interact with actually based off your mood and adapting to you in real time is fascinating. I, I'm kind of curious one by one what do you feel like, what is the greater social impact of where this goes if you could take it as far as you can go? Um. I think uh, for me, it's just moving away from a screen, um, a screens, from 2D digital screen. That's going to really transform how we see the world because we are so much uh, bombarded with various devices around us, from our phone to our uh, laptops and various devices. I think we just constantly get bombarded with this information. I think. It's very exciting to see if materials themselves can be, can be augmented with some sort of intelligence and tell you about the information and how you're doing. Imagine your garment uh, color changed to red if you're stressed, so you, you, you already know that you have to calm down. You don't need to look at your phone, open up your phone, there's a notification telling you that your heartbeat is going high, so you have to calm down. I think gradually like we have to see that the materials themselves have the language to, to communicate with you. Uh, maybe they get wrinkled, maybe they change colors, and, and I think um, the social implication of that, it's going to be tremendous. Well, I think we can probably eliminate healthcare-associated infections and all kinds of different harms in hospitals. I mean, this is all about behavior. We've done so much to like hard stop stuff in healthcare. Those of you who work in an industry that has like a, some sort of electronic way of like you have to log in here or sign in here in order to do something, or you have to click this box in order for the next thing to happen. That works really well for a lot of stuff, but it can't do. Every time I give a talk like this, somebody asks me, "Why don't you just?" lock the patient's door until people clean their hands. And I'm like, because it's not a prison. And so, um, but like everybody wants a hard stop, right? And, and that's, what, that's what everybody's looking for. But that's not, that's not really what you want. You want a way to be able to change your behavior easily without too much pain and suffering in order to be able to do what it is that you want to be doing all the time. And that's what I think we can get to. I think we learn the lessons from hand hygiene. We can learn how to apply those same things to other behaviors we want to see in healthcare, and I think it can go beyond even healthcare to personal health and other things that we want to change. It's about the interaction of monitoring and behavior and change. I think the the social impact of uh, renewable technology is definitely uh, very obvious because uh, it's a new way of life of using energy. Like, uh, for example, people, a lot of you know, car companies are developing battery cars already using the electricity, maybe from the solar panels. So you don't need to burn the gas and emit a lot of pollution and um, CO2. Um, I think that's the modern way of uh, us to use the energy more efficiently, more clean, and we pay more attention on the environment Right now, because you know, in developing countries, there are sometimes can have you know PM 2.5. Uh, that is the air pollution. People can breathe into their lung, can you know get disease or so. Um, people, you know, even in developing countries, are get more attentions with the you know the global uh, uh, attentions on the global warming effect or the environmental issues. So that's. I think all the effects are along the, uh, the development of uh, the, um, uh, the renewable technologies. And people get aware that that is important. We need to leave a, a blue sky, you know, a, a clean environment to our next generations, and so on. All right, before I get to the next question, I want to make sure that everyone knows you can ask questions in a few minutes here. We're going to open up to the audience, so definitely think of a, a question you may have, and uh, we'll get to it. And then one final question for me. So uh, I, feel, I feel like when you, when you have these gigantic endeavors, it becomes incredibly intimidating to think of, like, what's the next step? Like, what, like a journey of a 1,000 miles starts with one step. So I guess where do you go from here? What is the next step for, for each one of you working on your projects? Wow, <laughs> that was a tough question. <laughs> what could be a more immediate one? Like, oh, I have this big challenge in the next three months that I really need to take care of. Just I'm curious, like, 
wanted to know about your process of like how you're actually tackling such a massive problem just one step at a time going forward. I'm, I'm certainly interested to uh, pursue this uh, vision of interfacing with human emotion more. I think more technology requires to um, really address human emotion. Um, and this is not something that I personally say. This is really based on the research on affective computing, which is really looking at how computational system and artificial intelligence is able to simulate and interpret human emotion. So I'm interested to, in my uh, future work, to really dive even deep uh, and deeper into this um, and understanding how, how can we understand, how we can develop empathy between human and technology, between human and the built environments. Um, that's my goal. I'm gonna get up tomorrow morning and I'm gonna have a phone call with all my nurse leaders. <laughs> And I'm gonna hear about how last week went with their hand hygiene, and they're gonna tell me their data, and I'm gonna ask them what happened, and I'm gonna ask them what they saw when they were out there, and we're gonna write down everything, and we're gonna see if there's anything new we can glean from the data, and then we're gonna go back and look at more data, and we're gonna compare things, and we're gonna maybe find something new that we didn't know about the day before. And if we do, then we're gonna try and try it other places and see if we can replicate the success. And that's what we do literally every single day when we're talking about this. I mean, that's just one piece of what I do, but that's, that's the next step. The next step is to figure out how to make it a little better than it was the day before and keep it that way. I wish the, um, the chemicals and the fuels that uh, generated from the artificial photosynthesis system that I introduced in the future can be even cheaper than the fuels that we generated in a traditional way, you know, burning the um, fossil fuels, you know, uh, doing the traditional in, uh, industrial chemical engineering process. And that is actually what will be coming true uh, in the future as we are estimating the, um, the decrease of the renewable electricity, the price becomes lower and lower, and that becomes a very, very strong momentum that through the renewable synthesis way, we can get these products with a much lower price than currently we generated from fossil fuels. Then we can receive the momentum from market and with, even without the help of uh, government incentives, then it can become self-development and can have uh, more market in the, in the future. All right, all right. So now we're gonna open up to all of you. Uh, does anyone have a burning question uh, up front here? Dr. Landon, do you recommend using gloves when using equipment in a fitness club? And what do you think of using the steam room and the sauna? All right. <laughs> Number one, gloves are only as good as when you don't touch your face when you have them on. Okay, and we touch our face all the time. I just touched mine, didn't even mean to do it. Um, so uh, the gloves are really gonna protect the equipment. It, the most important thing when you're talking about sports equipment is you wanna wipe it down before you use it. All those signs that tell you to wipe it down after you're done, that is like relying on some sort of social capital and goodness that does not exist. And so you should wipe it down before you use it, then it's clean, and then if you're really nice, then you should also wipe it down for the next person in case they forget. But know that you, you know, wipe it down before you use it. And then I think the steam rooms, it kind of depends. Okay, now we're gonna talk about Legionella for a second here. You gotta, <laughs> this is a complicated question that you, you've asked. And it depends a little bit on the actual temperature of the steam, what the plumbing's like, what their water management plan is, and who's taking care of it. You probably want to have some idea. It's probably pretty safe in most steam rooms and most, in most places because it's too hot for most things to live. Um, and then I forgot what the third part of the question was because I got really involved in the first two parts of the question. Mm -hmm. Oh, the sauna. You know, um, I would wear a towel in the sauna and put a towel between myself and the surface I'm sitting on. Um, but I don't really have a problem with saunas. Actually, they're so hot that a lot of things don't survive. Um, those saunas that aren't really that hot or the steam rooms that have like just a little mist, mists, mists are bad. Stay away from mists. <laughs> there you go. That's basic good advice. So, Sarah, uh, second question. There's a microphone coming. Hi, so two of you touched on the use of data and AI and how it can be controversial. 
Um, so my question is, how do you make sure that the data that you're collecting and how you're using it is fair and equitable? Generations like that when you guys were in your creation process? Um, that's a good question. I personally don't uh, store any information, and I believe that even if you develop a company and you, you develop a product that it goes to, to the public like that, you shouldn't, you should leave that to the users that if they want to share their data or not. But at the moment, uh, we are not uh, basically storing or reading any data from, from the garments. Uh, this potentially can be a tool for, for surveillance but, um, and, and potentially can be used in a bad way, but I, I personally think that we should stay clear from that and just leave that option for the users to decide if they want to share their information or not. I also, I mean, this is healthcare, right? We, we collect a lot of data and we protect it very carefully. There are a lot of laws about how to do that. Um, when it comes to healthcare workers, we think that their privacy is really important too. People were not thrilled about the idea of having all this data. We don't actually collect individual data in this system that we have, but we're moving toward a more individualized system. And um, the answer to that is who gets the data is really important. And transparency about who's getting the data and when they're getting it and how they're getting it and what it's showing is also really important. We agree that end user should have the, in, when it's your job, you don't necessarily get to say, my employer doesn't get to see how often I clean my hands. Like, is that really fair? No. Um, but uh, they should get to know what's being shared and who it's being shared with and when, and then they can opt in or opt out based on their employment decisions. But this is something that's happening a lot more with a lot of different companies, not just healthcare. Question in the back here. Um, this is for um, Hao Tan Wang. Uh, what sort of scale is required um, to kind of have a measurable impact on CO2 reduction um, within your, the kind of confines of your project um, in order to kind of close that carbon loop? What kind of scale is required for the project you're developing? That's a very good question. That's a tremendous scale, actually. <laughs> uh, you can, we can do a simple calculation of how many, you know, you know, uh, gas molecules in the atmosphere, and we have like 400 ppm of CO2 in the in the in the atmosphere. And I think somebody did that before, but I don't know the exact number. But if you completely convert a lot of the CO2 back into like 1,000 years ago's level, we run out of the electricity. So we don't have so many electricity to convert that. But it doesn't mean that we need to use electricity alone to close the whole loop. Um, we are trying to uh, propose a way that we generate fuels that we use every day. For example, hydrogen peroxide for disinfection. We can use electricity from the solar instead of you, you know, burning coals. So using that part as a reducing a lot of CO2 emission currently. And that's the way we want to close the loop, but not saying that we completely convert all the existing CO2s back into the fuse. Got a question over here. Uh, first, thanks so much, guys. Uh, I'm interested to hear a little bit about implementation, particularly from Professor Wong and Dr. Landon. Uh, so it sounds like both of you have uh, somewhat put together uh, solutions for very large problems. Um, and on one part, let's say we all work in organizations, uh, many of us work in organizations that also have problems that have solutions that need to be implemented. Um, but a lot of what I hear, at least, is that there's practical, uh, practical things that keep from um, the adoption of the solutions. I'd like to hear uh, from you guys, maybe expanding a little bit more on um, what those problems are and how you uh, get over them, both specific to your work and also maybe in general, if you're willing to. Thanks. Uh, I'll just say implementation is the problem. I mean, everybody knows they're supposed to clean their hands. It's getting them to do it that is the problem. And implementing these technologies are ways to help people get there. Um, I think when it comes to implementation science, which is actually an area in which I do a, a lot of work, like basically everything, um, 
it's, we don't know everything there is to know. I don't even think we know a pinhead's amount of what we need to know about implementation. We know a little bit about this and a little bit about that, but putting it all together, like you can't checklist everything, you can't hard stop everything, you can't just say that, you know, anesthesia is like aviation, like there's just, that nothing crosses over as much as you want it to. And I honestly think that there is a huge benefit to trial and error, to letting people who are at the front lines, we would also call it um, frontline ownership, letting the people at the front lines make the decisions about how to improve things. And so when we implemented our major technology about hand hygiene, I was asked, so what are you gonna have everybody do now to improve their hand hygiene? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> We're gonna let them decide, and everybody was like, no, you must come up with something and everyone must do it. And I was like, that's a bad idea. So um, instead, we let all the frontline people say, I wanna try this, I think my team will respond to that. Let's, do, let's work on this. And then what works, we expand to other places and we keep trying different ways. And we're learning tons about how to implement this and how to change behavior. But that idea about how to change behavior in a workplace when you really need everybody to do it the same way, it's not about, behavioral economics can help us to a certain degree, but they let people make choices. There's no choice about hand hygiene. You may not choose, sorry, you may not choose to, so there's probably somebody in the ER with measles. <laughs> that is like the, yeah. Um, so the, you cannot choose to not do it. And so it's not the same as behavioral economics. There is no choice. We can only nudge people so far into doing this because at some point you have to use a stick and say, no, you must do it. And so when to switch from carrots to sticks and how to do all of those things is tricky. And I would say frontline ownership, let teams, team leaders decide and hold them accountable for making a lot of decisions and a lot of turnaround quickly in terms of, um, did it work, did it not work, what are you gonna do next? Over and over and over again. That'll get you adoption faster. I mean, the uh, implementation of uh, renovated technology out of the lab into the market is actually uh, very challenging, I have to say, and it takes a lot of time. So there are some statistics uh, showing that a lot of startup companies uh, you know, in Bay Area uh, from the technology developed in the uh, lab to the final commercialization, you only take five to 10 years. But you know, in university, it is not the major roles for us to really do this commercialization process. You know, university always carries two major tasks. One is innovation of technology. We want to propose a new directions, potentially can be can replace some of the existing technologies existing in the market. Number two, very importantly, is to understand the fundamental things for the purpose of only understanding as well as education. Because during that process, the student catch up a lot of the fundamental knowledges and learn the skills for their future use in industry. So actually, in university, we do not emphasize the most of commercialization, but the commercialization is actually a, a side product as we have these re innovations, and we need to team up with a lot of outside resources together. You know, uh, we see, you know, government, a lot of things can finally make that happen. Is there another question? Oh, in the back here. Hi, um, congratulations on the MRSA reduction. That's fantastic. Um, so for Dr. Landon, did you see any other beneficial outcomes come into play alongside um, the MRSA tracking, for example, a reduction of other infections or just other beneficial outcomes that also mimic the same thing with that initiative? Yeah, the good news is that we don't have a ton of healthcare associated infections at the University of Chicago. <laughs> um, and so the ones that we track, it's really hard to show a reduction when you already have really few events. Um, plus, we're also doing about 50,000 other things to help reduce central line associated bloodstream infections, catheter associated urinary tract infections, surgical site infections. We have a whole Ebola program. I mean, there's like a ton of things we do. And so it's really hard to blame hand hygiene for one thing. But I will tell you something interesting that's happened. The teams and the areas that have better hand hygiene compliance are safer in other ways too. Because it turns out when the team is able to change their culture and do a better job with something that happens as frequently as hand hygiene, they tend to be able to adopt other new initiatives well as well. Um, and that is, I think, an important thing that 
we've learned. I'm not sure if it'll hold up for everywhere, but it's definitely one of the main benefits that we've seen. I hope that's satisfactory. I wish I could tell you uh, more, but we need to do all sorts of, we, we've all actually looked into doing all these sorts of culturing to look if there's any transmission of like colonization, because we, we need more events <laughs> to reduce, which is great, we'll keep it. Is there one more question? Oh, back here. Thank you. My question is for Benaz, but congratulations to all of you. For, um, and it's really interesting and striking to hear about the application of te technology in so many different ways. My question for Benaz is um, I'm really struck by the machine interpretation of human emotion. And when you, I'm curious if you would talk a little bit more about how. Um, the system that you currently have in the exhibition recognizes across cultures and racial features of different people's faces, because certain expressions in a certain culture can mean something different in another culture. So would you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, uh, that's a great question. And, and, and I don't believe that emotions are universal. However, I've been also uh, sort of believer in certain emotions, uh, like basic emotions that Paul Ekman talks about, who was the anthropologist and, and scientist of working on emotion, and believing that there is six basic emotion, happiness, sadness, anger, surprise, and, and uh, disgust. Um, uh, and there's one more I forgot now. But um, uh, so these basic emotions, they're in his research, he showed that it's across many um, different races, uh, even uh, very primitive tribes, they actually share those basic emotions. Um, every culture shows happiness with a smile, with uh, pulling the muscles in the face in a certain way. So um, I, I think the notion of emotion can be more complex than that. And there is a lot of micro expressions that we have in our facial expressions that um, it's very difficult to decode. Um, also, a lot of expression of emotion has to do with the context. You might uh, smile at me, but that a smile might have different uh, uh, meaning, not necessarily happiness. So understanding the context, I think it's, it's very uh, complex, and, and, and I think um, very difficult to detect at the moment. My current uh, system basically just has a facial tracking that detects five basic emotions and respond to those emotions. However, I'm interested to pursue in future that how we can not only use computer vision, but we use some sort of biometric sensors that simultaneously can capture information from uh, basically the peak of emotional, um, uh, emotional reaction in the body. So it, together they can have a better understanding of the context as well as expression of the emotion. But it is a complex question, and the more I read and study, um, study emotion, the more I understand that it is very culturally specific. All right. That's all the time we have for questions. Uh, I just want to thank everybody for uh, being here. It was absolutely fascinating. And uh, I'll make sure I get I'll make sure I get the names of these things correct. Because in the back, we actually have some fun things. If we look at the, there's the Barking Mad uh, coat and the Thunderstorm dress uh, in the back there. So please check those out from the Museum of Science, Science Industry. And now Brittany is going to close out with some closing remarks. And just want to say, again, thank you for coming. Really appreciate it. And yeah. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.